sports arenas, gun safety, safer schools, and yes, marijuana. These are just some of the things that the Virginia General Assembly is considering in the fourth week of its legislative session. What will be the outcome? How will Democrats and Republicans vote? And what will the governor say? It's Stay in the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. Thank you for joining us for this year's series of the 2024 Virginia General Assembly as we do our bill in review. Once again, thank you for joining us. It's Stay in the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. Again, where we bring movers, shakers, and policymakers to you to discuss issues important to the community. You know, this is a great time of the year. We all know that that have been listening to the show. Uh, I do a General Assembly series review, and this is our opportunity for us to delve into the policies and the legislation that's going to control our lives. So with that, this gives us an opportunity to invite lawmakers, policymakers, everyday citizens, advocates, and yes, you, the listening public, to understand the ins and outs and the nuances of what's taking place in your state capital. <laughs> but before I go any further, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and supporting us. Over the several years that we've been doing this show, you showed up every single Sunday. And without you, we can do what we do. As we continue to broadcast from the Norfolk State University, home of the Spartan Nation, from none other than WNSB Hot 91, the soul of VA. So as we continue to uh, move through this series, I want you to make sure that you stay involved, stay engaged, because the legislation that's passing is legislation that's going to be impactful in our lives. So before we delve into these three areas, these hot button issues, I want to just talk about our NSU Day on the Hill. Here at Norfolk State, our NSU Day on the Hill is our premier advocacy day in Richmond. Led by our president, Dr. Javon Adams Gaston, we are able to take our students, our alumni, our faculty, our staff to the General Assembly to advocate on behalf of the institution. It's an opportunity to show legislators of the greatness of what is Norfolk State University. Also, it gives them an opportunity to learn about and support our legislative priorities that are laid out by our president and approved by our board of visitors and also champion across the board with our alumni and also our uh, stakeholders, more specifically our students and our faculty and staff. This year, we had an opportunity to bring two busloads on Capitol Hill where we were engaged by many legislators, including the first African-American Speaker of the House, none other than Delegate Dunn Scott, who represents the city of Portsmouth. Also, NSU alums, none other than Senator Louise Lucas, who is the ranking member in the General Assembly and the legislature, and also the first African-American woman to chair the very powerful Senate and finance, Senate Finance Committee. We are also greeted by our other alums from Norfolk State, Senator Lamont Bagby, Delegate Cliff Hayes Jr., who is definitely a friend of the station, a friend of the university, and also Delegate Candy King. And we also were greeted by Senator Mamie Locke, who also leads a very important area in our General Assembly and has been a champion for higher education all the years that she's been in government herself. And not only that, but we had an opportunity uh, to hear from our Virginia Beach representatives, none other than Senator Aaron Rouse, who is definitely a major supporter of Norfolk State, and also Alex Askew, who also is a major supporter of our institution. Our students then had an opportunity to go to various legislators' offices and visit with them to talk about, again, those things that are important to our institution, the legislative priorities, the capital that we have here in our operating budget. Once again, it was an opportunity to show that the Norfolk State University is good ground to be sown into. And to cap it all off, we were able to go to the House and the Senate where our president, along with alumni, students, faculty, and staff, were recognized on the floors of the House of Delegates and also the floor of the Senate. And 
once again, it's a it's always a great day to behold the green and gold. And on the hill, it was definitely a great day to behold. So again, thank you to all our legislators for visit for what you've done for us. And also thank you to all of our stakeholders that came on the on, on our day on the hill to support us and what we do for our institution. You know, I also like to now kind of delve into what I think are three hot button issues that are right now being debated in the legislature. Yeah, you, know, you know, there are many bills that are foul. You know, we had almost 3,000 bills that were pre foul <laughs> for the legislature to consider, almost 3,000. We currently have a little bit over 2,000 left that are being considered. But after this week, uh, the, the bills that are going to survive and, and have some type of life to go on to the next stage happened this week. So now we have, we'll find out the final number uh, coming up, but there's definitely going to be less than than 2,000 bills. But these bills now go to what's called crossover. And we'll delve into the process a little bit more uh, in upcoming shows. But the crossover is where the bills from the House go to the Senate and the bills from the Senate go to the House. And now they take a look at what was created, change it up a little bit, and then they come together at the end in a conference where they put it together, and then from there it's voted on and passed and sent to the governor's desk for him to sign it. Or he can veto it, or he could do nothing to it and allow it to become law. This is the balance of our system. This is the balance of our government at work. And this is how we make laws here in the Commonwealth in order to benefit your lives. Now, You know, one great thing about what took place in our elections and what we have going on now in the Commonwealth of Virginia, which I think can be an example to all legislatures and also our federal government of how to govern well. You know, this is Black History Month, and we were able to uh, have many visits from our Virginia Legislative Black Caucus members. We were able to uh, engage them, and they were able to engage us. And one thing that was pointed out is that in this particular uh, session, and now in our government, in order for, once our budget becomes official, it will have three signatures on it. Those three signatures, one will be the governor, but the other two signatures will be that of two African Americans. And think about that. In order for our budget to be official, two of the three signatures will be by African-Americans in the state. Of course, the significance of that is tremendous with the history of our people in the state and the history of our people in this, in this country. But it also shows the progress, it shows the confidence, and it shows also the courage and the bravery of the people that are holding these offices. So it just shows, as Don Scott said, Del- Speaker of the House, let nobody Nobody stop your dream. Even if those are the ones that love you, that are trying to protect you, don't let anybody stop your dreams. And that's a beautiful thing. So for those of you out there dreaming, keep dreaming, but also continue to work toward it. So let's delve into a few pieces of legislation that I think are extremely important and they're going to be very tremendous for our Commonwealth moving forward. Let's take a look at the sports arena. Now, Many of us have heard that there is a proposal and there is a deal that is to be made and that's on the table for the Washington Wizards and the Washington Capitals, which is the basketball team in D.C. and also the hockey team, to move out of the District of Columbia into the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, for those of you and all of us that travel to D.C. and Virginia and Maryland, we all know in West Virginia, it's really a hop, skip and a jump for the most part. If you don't have to deal with traffic, right? But to move out of D.C. into where we are, that would be a tremendous boost to our economy, a tremendous boost to our, 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 our hold on what is good about the Commonwealth and, and professional sports. So what is at stake as it relates to the legislation to make it happen? So according to WUSA Channel 9, 
It says that the Capitol Wizards owner says the move to Alexandria is happening pending Virginia approval. As a matter of fact, in his first public interview, according to WUSA, since announcing the move, Ted Leonsis, who is the owner, says that he can overcome traffic concerns at Potomac Yard, and he promises the new arena will be iconic. So with that being the case, uh, they also report that the owner said he was surprised by the outrage on social media about his plans to move from Capital One Arena in Penn Quarter to a state-of-the-art 20,000-seat arena in Potomac Yard. He said, quote, I've been hurt by that. That's my personality. Uh, But he also said, I'm not one of your typical business person. I care what people think. Now, according to WUSA, Channel 9, and also other reports, uh, this is going to be the proposed arena and music venue would sit on 12 acres, paid for with a $2.8 billion loan. All right, that's a loan we're going to talk about in a moment from the state of Virginia in the form of what's known as moral obligation bonds. <laughs> and Monumental, which is the sports group, would contribute $400 million, and the city of Alexandria roughly $100 million. So the owner says, according to WSA Channel 9, it was really an issue for the potential of having this blank slate, if you will, and starting from scratch and imagining how can we build an iconic next generation kind of digital interactive campus. He also says that uh, he was most focused on is will be sports, what it will be looking like. What will the fan experience look like? 10 20, and 30 years from now. Now, he said that Capital One has been great home for them, and they appreciate everything about it, but it's three acres, and it's very hard to expand. So let's take a look at what the the owner, he's saying that I want to expand. I want to be able to do things, do more things, and he's fan-centered. What is the experience of fans? Now, we know from other arenas, of course, uh, what they call Jerry's World for the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas Cowboy fans, maybe next year. We have, <laughs> I have a lot of friends with Dallas Cowboy fans, so it's all good. I'm a New Orleans Saints fan, so I get it. Uh, but that arena actually really started what we know as the fan experience. you know. And a lot of stadiums are now adopted. A lot of owners, a lot of groups are saying, hey, we want this for our fans. you know. And not just that, but what – what is the contribution to the, and the impact upon the local community, the tax dollars? Because we know that sports is a or high generating, but who does it benefit? And what is the tax base as it relates to that? So let's delve into the article a little bit more and see what they say about that. According to WSA Channel 9, tax revenue from the arena and the 6,000 seat concert venue, including ticket sales, parking, and also the naming rights for everything except the arena would repay the loan over 40 years. All right, so that's 40 years. Now, 40 years, Lord say the same, I'll be 88 years old, approximately 89 after the loans are, are set. So that means that this now burden, is, if it doesn't pay for itself, it's getting placed on not just me, but more likely my children, my sons, and their children, my grandchildren. So I think this is some of the trepidation that some people are having as it relates to this particular bill. But again, moral obligation bonds, quote unquote, you know, saying that you promise to pay this. It's a moral obligation. But is it a legal obligation? Let's read a little bit further. So the Virginia Sports Authority, which would be created by the Virginia legislature, again, it would be created by to authorize the arena loan would be required to put two years, two years of payments in a rainy day reserve fund just in case revenue projections don't meet expectations. There it is. And part of the agreement, Monumental was signed a 35-year lease to stay in the new arena, and the owner said criticism that he was stealing his teams away from the District of Columbia was unfounded. Quote, he says, the compelling reason that we consider moving to Virginia is it's still the DMV. It's three and a half miles from here, referring to the distance from Capital One Arena to 
where the new proposed stadium is located. But when asked if fans from Maryland would still make the trip, uh, the owner noted that, you know, the drive from his home from Potomac, Maryland, to the new arena site is eight minutes shorter once construction on the GW Parkway is complete compared to his current commute to Capital One. Now, according to WSA Channel 9, it says fans in D.C. have been largely dismayed over the move. Opposition in Alexandria is mounting as well, led by grassroots organizations entitled, quote, Stop the Potomac Yard Arena, unquote. And much of the opposition centers around traffic. So with that, the owner says that they have a right to be upset, but there's traffic today. We want to be a solution to traffic. So he also cited work being done around Golden Gate Bridge uh, as well um, as it relates to what's happening there in San Francisco and other high traffic areas and accessing um, San Francisco's Uber in, in San Francisco, easing access to Uber and Lyft. Uh, in addition to that, he says Nationals Park had a metro. Their stadium is twice as big as their arena. So the owner says, so what did the Nationals do? What did they do to the city to accommodate the Nationals? He added, they added elevators. They added easier ways to get in and out. But they didn't have to do anything to the stadium, and that's what we're going to have to do. So uh, finally, it kind of just shows, again, what the opposition is to this. And it also shows that Virginia would be required, again, to pay $2.8 billion in moral obligation bonds. Moral obligation bonds, <laughs> a moral obligation to pay it. And that monumental sports entertainment said that, for the most part, in the event that the $2.8 billion in, in payments is in the event that, again, payments do not meet financial revenue and projections. But Monumental Sports Entertainment says that that won't happen for three reasons. And why is that? Only one-third of projected revenue is needed to pay off the bond. The rest goes to Arlington and the state. Number two, Virginia Sports Authority, which would be created to authorize the loan, would be required to put two years payment in rainy day fund just in case. And thirdly, the lending institution and Virginia government take a conservative approach to revenue estimates providing what's known in the financial industry as two times coverage on the loan. In addition to that, Governor Glenn Youngkin estimates the project would create 30,000 jobs and $12 billion of economic benefits to the state. As a matter of fact, the Youngkin administration wrote, quote, this is one of a kind public private partnership will create what we know as one of the most innovative corridors in America. So let's kind of go back to this. We know that here we have to put up $2.8 billion in moral obligation bonds. That $2.8 billion is taxpayer money. And what we find is that with that taxpayer money, we're on the hook in the event that the revenue projections just don't meet. Now, I get it. I understand that as a businessman, you have to say that that won't happen. But we don't know that. We don't know what tomorrow holds. So for the most part, this is an investment. It's a risk. We all invest in retirement. And if we don't, we don't invest directly, we're paying our money into our retirement funds and they're being invested in the stock market, diversified assets and the like. But it's all a risk because it goes up and it goes down on various factors. So now the question becomes, what is the benefit? to the Commonwealth. The governor says 30,000 jobs, 12, 12 billion in revenue. You know, and also the city of Alexandria loves it, that 12 acres. But the citizens say, you know, enough is enough. Too much traffic. But there's not really much talk on the moral obligation bonds. Maybe it should be. But for the most part, we find that a lot of cities, a lot of municipalities go through this, go through land being taken, uh, for sports arenas and the like. Uh, it finds that these estimates are put up all the time. Sometimes it meets it, sometimes it exceeds it, sometimes it breaks even. But again, it's all up to chance. But we don't know. But one thing I do know is that this is a lot of money and it's also a lot of prestige. And the Commonwealth of Virginia, you know, since our last basketball team, the ABA team, right, we haven't had 
a basketball team he located physically here. Now we will have just that. So this gives us an opportunity to create a footprint in the sports, pro sports area. And who knows what happens next? Will there be a professional baseball team? Will there be a professional football team here in the Commonwealth of Virginia? We don't know. But what we do know is that this is the first start to it. So we're going to keep you constantly engaged. We're going to keep you up to date on this. But this now is a major uh, uh, issue, and it will be debated. And more than likely, we'll know uh, very soon what will take place. So let's talk about, in the last half of the show, let's talk about safety. I mentioned that there are three major issues that are up. And, and three issues, well, really more than three, but there were, this was one of the major issues that, were, that was discussed during the election. It was discussed also during the beginning of the General Assembly where we saw bills being pre-filed. And we know that there are a lot of people that are now um, basically really taking a look at gun safety, taking a look at school safety. We've seen so many, so many unfortunate and senseless acts of violence take place at our schools. You know, I don't have to name them. You, you know, you've seen them, and it's unfortunate events. Because when we send our kids to school, we want them to be safe. It's a place where they learn. It's the place where, to be very frank, they probably spend more time at school with their teachers and peers and friends than they do at home, engaging in the same level or, or same amount of conversation and interaction with parents and also with family. But with that being the case, we want to make sure that our children are safe and make sure that our schools are safe. So with that being the case, the Virginia Mercury reports that bills requiring schools to send parents gun safety notices clear the House and the Senate. As a matter of fact, the article says the Virginia Senate on Tuesday passed a bill requiring school boards to notify gun-only parents annually of their responsibility to safely store firearms and keep them away from children. Now, many of you may note, and this article also highlights it, that last year entrance in gun violence prevention measures increased after then six-year-old student brought a firearm from home to his Newport News Elementary School and shot his teacher. The teacher was injured, uh, but she did survive. And, of course, she was held as a hero by uh, after being shot, protected the rest of her class uh, from anything that would have happened in addition to that. So, again, we're thankful that no lives were lost and that others were protected in the heroism of that teacher. But again, this can be avoided or even or legislation can help for it to be avoided. So according to the Virginia Mercury, the legislation received support from the House in a 54-45 vote last week and is on track to reach Governor Yunkin, whose spokesman, Christian Martinez, said the governor will review any legislation that comes to his desk. As a matter of fact, in January, however, Yunkin said, quote, Virginia gun laws are already among the toughest in the nation, unquote, making it tough to predict if he will veto this legislation or other gun control laws introduced by Democrats. Now, uh, we find where uh, it's noted that unsecured firearms, according to Senator Steli, Stella Perkansky, Democrat of Fairfax, uh, she said it prevents, uh, it presents a grave threat to both children, those that are unsecured, by the way, and those around them. And during a 23 to 16 floor vote on Tuesday, uh, she stated that this bill is not meant to restrict or prevent any family's ability to defend themselves through law for gun ownership. It simply empowers parents with the knowledge they need to safely secure firearms in the home and encourage safety conversations with their children. Now, if passed, I want to note that if this is passed, according to the Virginia Mercury, school boards will be required to create a policy notifying parents each year by email and text of their, quote, legal responsibility to safely store any firearm present in the household, unquote. It also shows that in, in notes in the Virginia Mercury that the school board notices would also need to remind parents of the risk associated with improperly stored gun firearms, 
where statistics relating to firearm related accidents, injuries and death among youth and other safety tips and strategies, according to the legislation. Also, uh, the bills uh, that dictate the school emails and texts must be displayed in multiple languages, such as English and Spanish on the division's website and sent within 30 calendar days of each new school year. You know, moreover, the Virginia Mercury also notes where Delegate Mike Cherry, Republican, Colonial Heights, opposed the companion bill put forward by Delegate Laura Cohen, Democrat of Fairfax, and questioned if all schools have the capability to send texts, which I think they do, but texts during a House Education Subcommittee meeting. He also made an amendment request to relax the requirement for text messages, but it failed after the committee, including Delegate Alex Askew, Democrat of Virginia Beach, again, supporter of Norfolk State, Question of changing the language will create a loophole for schools not to follow the proposed law. So what are the, uh, of course, we know what the proponents of this say, of those that support it. But what is it? What do the opponents say about it? Well, it says that conservative groups primarily said the bill would create a negative notion about owning a firearm and scare parents. But supporters said the legislation is simply a helpful reminder. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Patricia Webb, a league uh, in a Citizens Defense League, Virginia Citizens Defense League representative, said that, quote, this bill goes much further and demonizes firearms instead of actually promoting education on safety and suicide awareness. And the group president, Philip Van Cleve, also agreed with it as well. But it's noted that in a 54 to 45 vote, the House passed the legislation. And in a 23 to 16 vote in the Senate, they passed the legislation. Now, I, I want to note something that in, there is a slight margin of advantage that the Democrats have in both the House and the Senate. And it's not those margins. So that means some Republican lawmakers actually voted for this bill as well. Now, I ask you, is it? Is it? demonizing gun ownership or is it just a reminder to say make sure you lock up your guns lock up your firearms because to be honest with you it does happen unfortunately that there are firearms that are not properly secured and unfortunately children that are not trained um, in gun safety and also adults end up causing harm to themselves or others as a matter of fact according to the Virginia Mercury it said some public schools have already taken measures to address violent threats to students and staff by reminding parents of the law and by adding weapon detectors to school buildings. As a matter of fact, they report that between 2016 and 2020 school years, Virginia recorded an average 1,910 cases involving weapons out of roughly 2,000 annual violent offenses committed by students in public schools, special education, alternative centers, and this is according to the Virginia Department of Education. But these offenses dropped during the pandemic when schools were closed, of course, for in-person. You only had 132 out of 135 violent student offenses. But this law, lawmakers are also proposing other firearm legislation related to schools this particular session. For example, prohibiting gun sellers from being located within 1.5 miles of an elementary, middle school, and preventing them from selling, trading, or transferring firearms near schools being considered by the House. But... Again, this is just a reminder to be safe with your guns. It's not saying you shouldn't have them, but this is an opportunity for us to keep our children safe at all times. <laughs> well, I know I wanted to get the several issues. I only had a chance to get the two, but we're going to continue to monitor legislation. We're going to continue to make sure to bring the salient information to you because we believe that a better informed society is a better society. As always, thank you for listening to Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Cleville. As always, be good, be great. God bless, and we'll see you next week.